tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friends. It's a very special night at Casa de Blood. That's right. It's Good Friday. But tell me what day of penance and fasting would be complete without a ride down Creosote Causeway. It's Split Tail Day, people. Praise Jesus. Fair enough, Chester. Since the boys are all together tonight, you can come in too. But no bumming smokes. After you, pal. Well, you can have just this one freebie, buddy. Here you go. Hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I was just thinking. How about visit simplyscarypodcast.com and sign up as a patron? You can get their entire catalog dating back to 2012 ad-free and available to download or stream. Just click the Patrons Area tab for as little as $5 a month, and you'll get all the horror you can handle. So tonight, Jeff finally coughed up another split tail, and in this one, we're joined by our good pal, Paul J. McSorley. And since Jeff can't seem to write anything without being offensive, he'd like to say preemptively, he's very fond of Wisconsinites. So saying, without further delay, I give you the Cheesehead. It came like a thief in the night. No, not Jesus. Well, he does too, of course, but that's not what we're talking about. And if he did, I doubt he'd be too thrilled with what he found down here. No, it's not the Almighty that hath descended upon Split Tail. It's a term called gentrification. Now, before you go asking me what that means, keep in mind I had to Google it, and I already forgot the definition. The only reason I remember the name itself is because it sounds like some other words in the same vein. Putrefication. Decimation. Rancidification. See, most words like that tend to describe something bad. Now, I'm not saying it's all plain bad, because that'd be judgmental of me only that the world is clearly going to hell, and just a little faster than I'd prefer. Like we're all carrying a big arm wall down the flight of stairs, and everyone's starting to lose their grip on it. Everyone but me and Dingo, anyway. But how are just the two of us supposed to carry such a heavy arm wall? Not to mention, I'm not exactly sure what an arm wall is, or if that's even the right word for it. Remind me to Google it later. Anyway, Along with this plague is something else I can't really define, but I know it when I see it. Corporate hedge money. I should have seen it coming the minute those places popped up where you can eat tacos and do your laundry at the same time, or shop for a new used car while you're eating a plate of barbecue. Hell, I knew we were in trouble the minute people started talking on the phone outdoors. I've thought long and hard about this mess we're in, and for me, it all started with the tragedy of old Mrs. Rutledge. You've heard of it, the poor gal who died in a home shopping accident. Dog chases the cat, Rutledge chases the dog, and we find her two days later wrapped head to toe in her 25-foot coiled phone cord, all blue and purple like a damn snake squeezed her. Two days later, her package showed up. A set of embroidered pot holders. Lord knows she died doing what she loved. Still, in the interest of public safety, cords became antennas. Then, before you knew it, there were mechanical toothbrushes, lavender-scented hand soap, microwave noodles, you name it. Super Mario, Teletubbies, Dragon Balls, Ninja Turtles. And even in the most pristine sanctum tucked safely away in God's country, no one was truly safe from the influx of culture. People who speak different than you do, think different than you do. People with alien ways and cultures. 
strange mannerisms, inferior beliefs. There are all sorts of different words for them. Scones, cheeseheads, Wisconsinites. In medical terms, people from Wisconsin. God help us. It was a pleasant enough day in Split Tail. I'll give it that much. The kind of weather when the wet, ripping farts of summer give way to cool wisps of breeze. And I'm sorry to go there so early, but on this particular day, it bears mentioning. Because the deputy and I were grabbing lunch at our favorite spot, Split Tail Taco and Dry Cleaning. Dingle was tapping away at his fancy cellular telephone, and between bites, I was just sitting there trying to reconcile myself to the fall of civilization. Hey, Sheriff, look at this one. Dingle turned his phone toward me, displaying an image of myself with bunny ears and a little pink nose. Well, goddamn, I said, and when I did, two little bunny teeth popped out of my mouth. Not my real mouth, but the one on the phone there. Look at this one, Sheriff. He hit another button on the screen and my face crunched up and my mustache disappeared. I turned away in disgust. What's the matter, Sheriff? You ever feel like the goddamn world is burning down around you, Dingle, and that you're the only damn one who seems to notice? Oh, all the time, Sheriff. Hey, you know if you install this app too, we can send each other funny pictures all day. We sit next to each other all day, Bonehead. A contemplative pause indeed. Well, I I guess you're right, Sheriff. Aren't I always? And then, right in time for the inciting incident, my radio popped up. Unit 1, do you copy? Well, what the hell is it, Frankie? It's taco time over here. We've received a report of a foul odor coming from somewhere near the old bank building by the square. My foul odor, you say? Right across from Laundry's place? I'll tell you, Frankie, it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma. It was Laundry who called in, Sheriff. Says he thinks there's a dead body somewhere. Well, goddamn, I said. If there's one skill I've honed in all my years of law enforcement, it has to be deductive reasoning. So saying, if it stunk that bad to Laundry, it had to be worse than goat shit. But still. Well, now, Frankie, between the two of us, here's my dilemma. See, as far as what laundry is smelling, it may just be his upper lip. But say it isn't. Once a dead fella starts to stink, about all he can do is go on stinking. A uh, taco, on the other hand. I've seen the crunchiest ones you can imagine go soft in 15 minutes flat. And that's just a damn tragedy, ain't it? Silence. Copy that, Unit 1. I just work here. Hey, look at this one, Sheriff. Dingle showed me his phone again, and this time I looked like an old man. Kinda profound, this one struck me. Because when it came down to it, this job of mine could take the crunch out of anyone's proverbial taco. And looking at Dingle's soft tacos there, I was only glad I had some firmness to begin with. Stow it, Dingle. We've got work to do. What did Frankie want, Sheriff? I wasn't paying attention. Says we got a funny odor coming from around Laundry's place. Sure it's not his upper lip again? If it is, I might fatten it up for him. May send him a bill for lunch, too. To that end, I stowed my receipt safely in my pocket and we headed out to the car. I made a point of blaring the siren all the way out to our dire emergency and parked politely on top of Laundry's garbage cans. To my surprise, though, once we got out of the car, there was a notable odor floating around. Laundry, resplendent in his signature overalls, appeared in the doorway. Damn it, Sheriff. I gave you your own police parking spot. It's right goddamn there. He pointed to the police-only sign around 15 feet away. I'm responding to an emergency here, Laundry. Now how am I supposed to do that if I park all the way over there? And what's this smell I'm hearing so much about? I think I got it pegged, Sheriff. I was just walking Liberace and he led me right to it. Look! He pointed across the way to the old bank building. 
I'm not sure when it ever really was a bank, but it still said so on the facing. It did yesterday, anyway, because that was now covered by a spray-painted plywood plank that read, La Fromagerie de Wisconsin. Hey, Sheriff, look at this. Dingle's phone had a picture of laundry on it, but with some kind of ladybug antennas. It said doors locked, but I seen some fella in there through the window. Whatever he's up to, it's stinking up the whole damn neighborhood. Even Liber... Even Liber... Liberace... And tossed his cookies. While I figured most of Laundry's fancy aperitifs could have contributed to that, I gave him my patented nod and waved Dingle to join me. The smell did intensify somewhat the closer we got to the old bank building, and I could see the fellow Laundry was talking about through the front window. Sporadically, the little storefront had been occupied by this proprietor or that, a vacuum cleaner repair shop, a TV repair shop, some fellow who made TVs out of vacuum cleaners, etc. But this was a hell of a town to start a formagerie in, whatever the hell that meant, and it sure as hell wasn't Wisconsin, wherever that is. I knocked on the door. Seeing my stately uniform and impressive mustache, he set down whatever he was doing and came to greet us. When the door opened, it hit me with a wave of hot, cheesy air that nearly took my breath away. Faintly, Bachman Turner Overdrive played in the background. Dingle dropped his phone when the smell hit him. Afternoon, officers. Hey, the place isn't quite set up yet, but come on inside. I just cracked a block of Limburger. The fella had on a camouflage button-down shirt and a pair of blue jeans with knee pads on them. Right away, from somewhere deep down in my sheriff's amygdala, my hinky Bruno alarm was softly sounding. Now, I'm not saying I hated the guy's guts right off the bat. That'd be plain prejudiced of me. I'm only saying that he was dressed like he was blowing someone out in the woods and didn't want to get caught. What's that damn smell? Dingle choked out. Jeez, eh? The man said. Limburger. Fine semi-soft cheese invented in Belgium. And <laughs> perfected in Wisconsin, don't you know? And you'd be glad to know. Split Tail's about to get taste of the finer things in life, yeah, hey. I took a peek over the man's shoulder there and saw the big wheels of cheese he was cutting up. The smell coming out of the place was somewhere between dirty gym socks and a moldering roadkill. I'm Paul, by the way. Just flew in from Wisconsin. <laughs> and boy, are my arms tired. Uh, well, Mr. Limburger, I'm sorry to hear about your arms there, but I gotta tell you, if those are your finest selections I'm smelling, I'd hate like hell to smell your less finer selections. The man's smile wavered a little bit, but he managed to hold on to his pleasant Midwesternness for the moment. Oh, that's how you know it's good cheese, don't you know? It's normally aged one to three months, but here at La Fomorge de Wisconsin, I age it at least half a year. It gets that real earthy aroma, huh? Come on in and have taste. We can eat some cheese and have a beer. I don't give a fuck. I heard Laundry shout from across the way. He made my damn goat throw up. Sheriff? I'm not going in there, Sheriff. I've smelled cheese before. That ain't cheese. I don't know what that is, but that ain't it. Dingle looked like a grazing deer who had just caught a whiff of aqua velva. The cheese fella stood there holding the door open like a fancy fragrance consultant. Well, Mr. Cheese fella, I'm not exactly sure how to approach this one. You say you're selling cheese, but Laundry over there says you made his goat throw up. And Dingle here, and there's no finer a judge of fancy comestibles, he says he smelled cheese before, and yours doesn't appear to tickle his fancy. So, I don't know, maybe you should consider just packing back up and flying back to Wisconsin. If your arms still have it in them, that is. So much for friendly advice. Mr. Cheesefella promptly underwent a kind of transformation right in front of me. His eyes widened real big so you could see the whites all around him, and his nostrils even flared a little 
and God help me, his left ear started shaking, almost vibrating, like he was trying to shoo away a horse fly. Hey, fuck you, moose fucker. This is the best fucking cheese there is. And you moose fuckers are gonna eat it too. Cripes, I'll fuck both you moose fuckers, yeah? Well, hold on there just a second, cheese fella, I said. And I'm not saying I didn't catch that last sentence of his. It only seemed like some kind of anger-fragmented shard of a comment. More concerning was the sudden shift in temperament, and I could see his fingers working down there, like they were fixing to turn into fists. Meanwhile, the deputy looked like a kid with a spoonful of medicine in his face. Time for diplomacy. All I'm suggesting is this town in particular might not be the most adventurous eaters of cheese. I mean, look at poor Dingle here. He looks like he's seen a ghost. I don't understand, Sheriff. It, it smells like... It reminds me of... Well, geez, Sheriff, it's... It's something bad. Hey, fuck you then, Dingle, you moose fucker. It's called a gourmet entertaining cheese. And you better get used to it too, don't you know? Because I'm taking over this moose fucking town. You want cheese? It's coming through me, eh? Laundry leaned his head out the bar's door. Whoever rot is acting funny, <laughs> Sheriff, I think he might barf again. Don't make me come over there, moose fucker. I'll fuck the both of you. Go ahead and shoot him if you need to, Sheriff. <laughs> I ain't looking. The cheese fella regarded me then as if I'd do just that. You gonna shoot me, moose fucker? Well... You'd better have some pretty nice bullets, huh? Because last time someone tried that, I peeled his face off and got some beers. I'll get beers right now, moose fucker. I don't give a fuck. Now hold on just one minute, fella. No one's getting shot today. All I was suggesting was that there's not such a big market around here for your particular brand of... Try it, moose fucker. I know that kung fu shit too, huh? I'll fuck your ass and go get beers. Try me, fucker! With this, he assumed a kind of karate stance I had no real answer to. The deputy, likewise, had no answer to anything. Something about the Limburger had left him shell-shocked. And I hate to admit what I'm about to tell you, but since it's just the two of us, I'm nothing if not honest. Here goes. The shell of my own proverbial taco was taken on moisture. That's to say, the crunch had gone out of me, and I was about to lose my lettuce. You know, if there's one thing I'd learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. You should never underestimate your opponents, especially on a half-empty stomach. That said, I did the unthinkable. I backed off, glad as ever Mr. Cheesefella couldn't see the shame behind my fancy mirrored sunglasses. Well, you can't win them all, I suppose. That's what I told Dingle as we drove back to the taco place to top off the tank. But Dingle, fairly traumatized as he was, decided to knock off early instead. And if you think that sounds ridiculous on the surface, I'd have to agree with you. Trouble was, he purportedly figured out what that stench reminded him of and got real quiet all of a sudden, and the life kinda drained from his eyes, and then he started clawing at his nipples and whimpering, and all that seemed a little undignified, you understand. Frankly, I'd never seen anything like it. So alone I sat in my favorite spot, parked under a shady little copse of trees by the foot of the hills. It's funny how even while civilization itself is in a state of self-immolation, while the stars are conspiring to tip over and plummet to earth, while the angels are aspirating the spit valves on their terrible trumpets, some places still seem fine and dandy. This was one of those places. No sound but the birds in the breeze rustling through the trees. The scent of pine and earth and whatever woodsy concoctions Wally and Ignatius were fermenting just up the path. Everything looked just ducky from where I was sitting. I peeked up at my photo of old summer there, the proverbial one that got away, traded all this natural beauty for a chance to make it up in the big city, 
and by all this natural beauty, of course, I mean more than the pristine wilderness. To that end, I examined my impeccable mustache in the rearview mirror inside. She had come back to me one day, I told myself. Until then, the photo stayed pinned to my visor. Just as I knew they eventually would, my two pals Wally and Ignatius emerged from the edge of the woods to investigate. As always, with that little pause once they caught sight of my cruiser, but I waved them over just to let them know I was agreeable today. Hey, Sheriff, how goes it? You ain't here to open up the gates of tyranny on us again, are you? Let me ask you something, Wally. Just where is the line between allowing total freedom and doing what you just described? Say, when someone's starting to stink up the town. Pussy farts? I don't think he's talking about us, Iggy. We only stink up the woods. You're talking about that cheesehead set up shop in the town, ain't you? God help us. It smells worse than Iggy's feet. John ho I nodded. Smell travels fast, it seemed. As long as no one knew, he had basically shouted me down and sent me limping back to my cruiser, dragging Dingle by the collar. I can't say I've ever been called a moose fucker before. They don't prepare you for that stuff in sheriff's school. Of course, some things a man doesn't have to be taught. Namely, when a man's pride is injured. There's no rubbing a little dirt on it and walking it off. Not a man in my position. You know, Wally, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. You can never be too proud to ask for advice. And being it's just the three of us here, and we all seem to be smelling the same issue, and especially since there's no one around to hear me doing it, I'm prepared to do just that. So where's my role in all this, Mr. Constitutionalist? How does a fellow like me do what I gotta do without offending any delicate sensibilities? Wally kind of pursed his lips and fell deep into thought. You could tell when he was deep in thought by the way his eyeballs drifted apart. More than usual, I mean. Well, Sheriff, you could try a little trick they call power of the pen. You pussy hole, Ignatius agreed. And how's that one work exactly? Easy. You write up a fancy decree that makes something illegal. Well, not not technically illegal, but kind of against the rules, see? It's something that makes it tough for the fella to do business, right? <coughs> Pusher. Yeah, right. It can't be too obvious. It's got to make some kind of sense. Wait, I, I think I've got a pretty good idea. And that's when he laid it on me. And I'll tell you, for a man who does his morning constitutional over a Home Depot bucket... He sure knows his stuff. And that very night, I sat down at my fancy computer with a stack of cheese safety literature and a snifter of my finest orange Fanta. Then, for the first time ever, I opened Microsoft Notepad. It felt kind of romantic in a way, and I wondered for a moment if I had chosen the right path through life after all. I imagined my life transposed with the life of a novelist. Me, of all people, not all buttoned up in sheriff's vestments, but draped in loose-fitting cotton clothing, maybe a turtleneck sweater. Naturally, I'd find myself in a more metropolitan locale, maybe Schenectady or thereabouts. I'd trade my polished leather boots for suede loafers. I'd switch my high karate cologne for English leather. But the mustache stays. Hell, maybe I'd even wax it. I always wanted to see the inside of a haberdashery. And I wondered what old Summer Sausage would think of me then, when she saw me sitting in the corner of some highfalutin espresso place, tapping away at my brand new portable computer with the apple on it, with that intense look on my face like I'm channeling my own little muse. Here and there, some adoring fan would walk up and praise me for my work, and I'd be polite, of course, but kind of curt and dismissive, too. Ronald Ball, Toast of Schenectady. What would Miss Summer Sausage think of me then? After realizing I'd been daydreaming for an hour and a half, I settled on the task at hand. The idea was to make Mr. Cheesefellas doing business here more trouble than it was worth, and to do so without being too blatant about it. What followed was a feat of reverse engineering. And by the time my official decree was ready to be printed down at the station, I was feeling pretty goddamn executive. And all I could think of after that was, 
I wonder what the hell is wrong with Dingle. The big day had arrived, and by the way Dingle was acting, you'd hardly know it. That's to say, the deputy wasn't exactly tearing up the pea patch. He just kind of sat there with this thousand-yard stare on his face. Same one he had had since the Limburger hit him. I nearly asked him about it too, but I wasn't sure I wanted the answer. Not on the day of my first executive action as High Sheriff, because if there's one thing I've learned in all these years as High Sheriff, it's this. Dingle's out to lunch, and a biscuit are too short at that. Thank God for yours truly is all I'm saying. I pulled up to the cheese shop in my customary manner and extracted a copy of my snazzy legal document to serve our new pal. Come on, Dingle. You don't want to miss this. I'm about to get all Ron Ball Esquire on Mr. Cheesefella. I don't really want to go in there, Sheriff. I appraised the deputy for a moment, gave him that stern mustache look of mine. What's gotten into you, deputy? I'm not sure I can talk about it, Sheriff. Not yet. I'm not ready. Well, good news, Dingle. I don't need you to talk about it. What I need is to be accompanied by my executive personnel. And that's you, deputy. So get with it. It's the smell, Sheriff. It really gets to me. Well, goddamn, I said. But pretty soon I had myself an idea. I do get those from time to time. I pushed open the door to the great waves of cheesy stench. Bachman Turner Overdrive popped through the place on an upgraded sound system. Mr. Cheesefella looked up from his new display of glass bottles, and I was relieved to see his eyes looked normal and his ear was no longer shaken. The bottle sat arranged on a couple of folding tables, bibbed by signs that read, Cheesehead Craft Brews, Drinking Style, Split Tail's Finest Imbibements. There were other signs here and there suggesting the perfect pairings between this cheese and that beer. And now that I noticed it, a little coffee set up in creation off to the left side of the room. Well, morning there, Mr. Cheesefella. I was just in the area this morning and I thought to myself, you know, I think the two of us might have gotten off on the wrong foot yesterday. So I thought the deputy and I might pop back in and start afresh. He nodded amiably. Well, sure. Maybe I got a little heated there. Water under the bridge. So, how are you guys doing? How about a beer? On the house. He was looking a little oddly at the deputy with the clothespin on his nose. The one I normally use to clip my expired fishing license and photo of summer sausage to the visor. But hell, these days, that could just as easily be a fashion trend. Well, I tell you. That's just as tempting as tempting can be. Ain't that right, deputy? Uh, sure, Sheriff. And Lord knows this here bottle of Asiago garlic porter looks real refreshing. But the deputy and I are on official business, you understand. How about just one, eh? I've got all sorts of fancy brews, don't you know? How about a Paul's Imperial Reuben, eh? It's brewed with pastrami and cabbage and aged in Thousand Island dressing barrels. Oh, uh, I just had one at breakfast, but we were only popping in to... Got a sweet hams contract too, don't you know? Two dollar draft, but just a buck for you guys, huh? Well, goddamn, I said, because Laundry's Genesee drafts were more than that, even after my police discount. But back to the matter at hand. Much appreciated, Mr. Cheesefella. But while we're discussing business matters, I'd be remiss not to inform you of our county's recent piece of legislation. And I presented him, rather lawyerly, with my document, in which I'd laid out Split Tail's new mandate that all cheeses must be pasteurized and facilities third-party tested in the interest of public safety. And this I explained out loud as he read along, with the white steadily growing around his eyes. And his nostrils started to flare again. And there goes his ear, shaking all by itself, like someone caught it with a fish hook and was trying to shake it loose. Who put you two moose fuckers up to this, eh? The moose fucker next door? I'll fuck that guy good, I will. Now just one second there, cheese fella. 
There's no need to get all flared up and shaky and angry at all this. I'm sure no one cares about public safety more than you, gentlemanly and sophisticated as you are. Where did you test your cheese around here, eh? Because I don't see too many laboratories. Just a bunch of moose fuckers and their fucking goats. Well, I'm not saying it's the most convenient executive decree I've ever heard, Mr. Cheese Guy. I'm not saying that at all. But even moose fuckers like Dingle and I have to navigate the occasional regulation or two. Ain't that right, Dingle? That's right, Sheriff. Rules and regulations is all. You want my Limburger, you fuckers? Take it! I don't give a fuck! With that, he seized the reeking and dripping bolus of cheese and hurled it into Dingle's arms. Dingle looked down at it like a deformed fetus. Then Cheese Guy smushed my executive order into it. You want my Limburger, fuckers? Think I give a fuck? I got your cheese. I got your beers. Before you know it, I'll be selling you moose fuckers oxygen. And after that, I'll be selling you craft oxygen for twice the price. And after that, you fuckers will appreciate good cheese, don't you know? Even Dingle there will pretend to like it. Because you moose fuckers are about to go out of style, eh? <laughs> To that end, he executed several unimpressive karate kicks. Hey, ho, 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 what the? Then he picked up a wooden cheese cutting board and bit it as hard as he could. I'll fuck both your asses, pal. I'll peel your skin off and fucking eat it. And then, like his own decree had been formally broadcasted, the bell announced two new customers, Will and Billy McMillan. Hiya, is it noon yet? It's always noon here, gentlemen. What can I get you two? Don't mind the moose fuckers, they were just leaving. Hey there, I said to the two. Isn't this when I normally see you two across the street? Normally, Billy said. But normally laundry doesn't have two dollar hams on tap. And laundry's place smells like goat shit. Smells nice in here. Reminds me of home. Well, goddamn. The deputy and I slinked out of there practically unnoticed, just as three more fellas came in. It seemed my executive death blow was no more than a fart in the wilderness. Cheese fellas decree, on the other hand, was a glowing sulfurous crack in the crust of the earth. Not the part about peeling my skin off, but the going out of style thing, because that's exactly what I saw in all my quiet, introspective lunchtime daydreams. This creeping evil that bubbled up from who knows where and was spreading so fast by the time you noticed it, it was already too late. Like a pebble crack in your windshield that crawls across the glass like some pervasive blood disease. Like some infernal Snapchat message that got sent to everyone. And now a whole generation's walking around with bunny ears and funny hairdos and ox rings in their noses like cattle. And suddenly, everything good and wholesome and traditional was going out of style. And that's when I realized the truth. That Mr. Cheese Guy wasn't from Wisconsin at all. He was from hell. Or maybe the two were one and the same. All that sulfur and brimstone and lake effect snow. Defeated, I left Split Tail's latest compound endeavor with the deputy in tow staring down at his armload of cheese like so much torturous baggage. And likewise, when he dumped it into the nearby garbage can, enough remained on his shirt that it would certainly never smell the same. If he had been shell-shocked before, he was plain traumatized now. Not a word came out of him for the rest of our shift. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement experience, it's this. You should never underestimate the enemy. So I demoted myself from Esquire back to Sheriff, and Dingle and I headed out, noting Laundry's dejected face poking out over the swinging doors of the saloon. We got in the car, and I glanced over at my pal, a shell of the man he had been just yesterday, befouled by both the events at hand and unspoken events of the past. You all right there, Dingle? Wanna take a picture of me with bunny ears or something? He just sat there staring down at his shirt. I let him keep the clothespin for the time being. 
Battles are won and lost every day, I tried to tell myself. But as larger wars are waged and the balance perpetually shifts back and forth, one constant is forever unfaltering. Noon is lunch. Strange days we live in. Now, my father hasn't been around for quite some time, but if he were, he'd tell you just the same thing. You could say it's a case of my generation was so much better at this or that, or our music was better, or whatever you care to point to. But no, I think I'm really onto something here. I think dark forces have breached the barrier between their world and ours. I'm not talking about nose rings or auto-tune or low-carb tortillas, nothing like that. I'm talking real-life evil. And when the rubber meets the road, it seems to me there will only be two guardians at the gate. I guess you already know who they are, and you'd better hope we stand firm too, because the minute we falter, you'll all be wearing nose rings. And even your farts will come out auto-tuned. And my father, God bless him, he'll be glad to have gotten out when he did. Strange days indeed. When here in the greatest country on earth, our most notable scholars are forced to live in makeshift yurts in the wilderness. Big tents patched with old car covers and Britney Spears concert shirts, made to defecate in paint cans and spackle buckets, and live on baked beans and canned ravioli, forced to do business under the cover of darkness for fear of reprisal. Well, they wouldn't get any of that from me, not unless they decided to charge me a consultant fee or something. Hey, Sheriff, Deputy, how goes the subterfuge? Hard to say, Wally. I legislated the prick out of the Limburger business, but now he's selling $2 drafts to the lunch crowd. $2? Drafts of what? Hams. Well, son of a bitch. Uh, Pussy fart? Search me, Iggy. I haven't had a hams in years. Your asshole chili fire. Wally sighed in agreement. I Iggy says this cheese fellow of yours is engaged in cutthroat capitalism. Hmm, um, titty dicks and the pussy of hearts. Pee mm, hole in the sex train. Mm, my titty, titty dicks and farts. Mm, pussy fart, tickle that butt nut. D double headed jelly dong. Fuck stick. Hmm, put it in the butt. Yeah, good point, Iggy. He says while minimum price control regulation can sometimes cause market distortion and discourage competition, <clears throat> when implemented carefully, it can also improve market diversity. Pussy. And service range. Mmm. And price controls. My do, fellas. Say, what's wrong with the deputy there? I realized Dingle was no longer next to me. I turned around and saw him staring at a big black gum tree. Just standing there looking at it with horror etched into his face. Oh, he's all right. He's been reading some real deep poetry lately. And he gets a little sentimental. Mm, pussy farts. Iggy gets that too. That's all right. <clears throat> Good luck, fellas. I retrieved my deputy and walked him back to the car before he could embarrass me further. Whatever the hell was wrong with him, I was going to have to get to the bottom of it before my next piece of legislation. Not that I really believed Cheese Guy would make love to my rear end and peel my skin off or anything, but he had sure bit that cutting board pretty damn hard. Just back in the cruiser, my radio popped up. Unit 1. Come in, Unit 1. What is it, Frankie? Reports of a fight down at the Cheese Guy's place. Do you copy? Well, goddamn. It had only been a matter of time, I guessed. Looks like we've got a job to do. Are you with me, Deputy? But Dingle was still stuck in that weird daze. Deputy! I gave him a little smack. One of his eyeballs went funny. Then he suddenly came out of it. You with me? Uh, what's that, Sheriff? I didn't bother explaining. Just threw on the cherries and pulled out onto the road. Down at the cheese place, or whatever the hell it was called, the lot was full of cars and motorcycles. I parked politely by the garbage cans to announce my arrival. Oftentimes that alone was enough to scatter the rats, as it were. But you could see clearly through the big windows that something unsavory was going on in there. 
not quite clearly enough to diagnose it as a fight, or even a mere kerfuffle, nor a ruckus, nor even a tizzy. Regardless, I released my seatbelt and reached for the handle. The deputy did nothing of the sort. Dingle, you mean to sit here and let me walk into a kerfuffle all by myself? Say it's a full-blown hullabaloo. What the hell has gotten into you lately? To be honest, I'm losing my goddamn patience. It's just... It's the smell, Sheriff. It brings back memories, is all. All right, spill it. Here we are with a potential brouhaha going on, and my deputy's a damn basket case. So out with it. What's the frequency, Dingle? He sat silently for a moment while a beer bottle crashed inside of the cheese place. Then he took a big breath and started talking. I was riding my bike one sunny day. My brand new Schwinn. Just took the training wheels off the week before. Pumped up the tires, tucked my laces into my shoes, and took her out for a spin. And I was just riding along, and all of a sudden, there's this guy sitting out on his porch there, and he goes, Hey, you pal. And he waves at me. Not like he was saying hi, more like he wanted me to stop and help him with something. So I stopped there on the sidewalk and leaned my bike on the kickstand and walk up to the porch. I can still remember the look in his eyes, like he was hunting me or something. But good-natured as I am, I walk up to his porch and say hello. Can I help him with something? And he says he's got candy and the brand new Spider-Man comic just inside. The door to the cheese place opened momentarily, and a man I didn't recognize rolled onto the pavement, got to his feet, and ran away. One of his pant legs was missing. So obviously I was excited to see the comic, right? So he opened the door and waved me in ahead of him. The first thing that hit me was the smell. Real bad, like old socks. Just like that cheese, Sheriff. But at the time, I just had to see that comic and see what kind of candy he had, you know? So he sits me on the couch and sits right next to me, you know? And he hands me the comic book. The Superior Spider-Man. And I was so excited, I hadn't even reached for the candy dish yet. But when I opened the cover, it didn't seem right. There was another cover under there. The cover of a completely different magazine in a picture of a... It was called Black Inches. And there was a... It was a big black wiener, Sheriff. Well, goddamn, I said. And he saw I was taken aback, right? So he reached over himself and started turning the pages for me. And there were just wieners, Sheriff. Page after page of them. And I glanced over and he, he had his own wiener out, Sheriff just wieners and the smell that cheesy awful smell and I Dingle was starting to tear up I had no idea anything like this had happened to him I also had very little idea how to handle such a situation nearby at the cheese place a mug flew through one of the windows oh pal that's awful I had no idea anything like that had happened to you. I don't know how long I sat there frozen, but I eventually snapped out of it and booked. And the next thing I remember, I was back at home in the shower. Couldn't even remember how I got there. I must have just ran because my bike was gone. I never saw my bike again. And that's all I remember, Sheriff. I um, must have blocked it all out until I caught a whiff of that funny cheese. It just all came rushing back. My God, pal. I'm truly sorry you went through all that. A wedge of cheese went through the same hole in the window that the previous mug had created and landed in the gravel. A cat ran up to it, sniffed it, and kept going. Uh, maybe I can appropriate some funds from the county to get you some therapy. Good God, Dingle. When did this happen, if you don't mind me asking? About five years ago. Five years ago this spring. A pause. A rather long one, relatively speaking. 
Um, just to clarify, Deputy, being that you're 42 years old as we currently live in brief, that would place your age at the time of this incident at 37? Just to clarify, when this happened, you were 37? That's right, Sheriff. They say time heals all wounds, but, well, once I caught a whiff of that cheese, it must be fresher in my mind than I thought, you know? I didn't know quite what to say just then, but if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it has to be this. I don't even fucking know anymore. Sometime thereabout, Liberace came busting through the door and ran back across the street toward Laundry's place. Now I had a pretty good idea who was causing that kerfuffle. Dingle? Not to be insensitive about your Black Inches incident, but I think we ought to get moving. The deputy gave me a look of somewhat renewed resolve. You know what, Sheriff? Feels good to get that off my chest. I think I can do this. He snatched a clothespin from my visor and stuck it on his nose. Law and order! The cheese place had a full house this afternoon. Overnight, he had given it a complete overhaul with dark colors, neon lights, and a noisy jukebox blaring BTO full volume. He had arranged the place like something between a contemporary coffee house and a combination Dunkin' Donuts slash Baskin Robbins. Cheese on the right, beer on the left. A reclaimed bar had gone up, lined with taps of his obscure brews and the most notable discount hams. The bar and table sat all of Laundry's regulars, and quite a few others I had never seen before. A younger crowd. Stranger still, Laundry himself and the lauded cheese fella appeared to be having a karate match. Laundry was circling him like a turn-of-the-century prize fighter. Cheese guy was southpaw with a mug of beer in his rear hand. Come at me, moose fucker. Come get some. You son of a bitch. I'll kill you. I'll kill you dead. Hey, play some skin art. That from a random patron. All my life, I got to struggle to get by. Scratching in the dirt. Working for scraps. What do I have to show for it all? Five, maybe six customers, a goat, and a beaver with an asshole for a face. And you want to take that from me too? I'll kill you, you cheesehead son of a bitch! Bring it, moose fucker. I'll fuck your ass, pally. Play some Skinner, man! Hey, fuck you too! Laundry charged the cheese guy and went for a double leg takedown pushing him back into a couple tables. Cheese Guy kept his beer steady, even took a sip while he was falling backwards. Laundry, unsure of how to capitalize on his dominant position, sank his teeth into Cheese Guy's thigh. Oh, you fucker! Cheese Guy took another sip and put his beer down. He boxed Laundry's ears, then picked his beer back up. Laundry stumbled backwards and tripped on old Mr. Anderson's fancy oxygen machine. The tube yanked out of Anderson's nose, and his glasses flew over the bar. My ears! What kind of cheap cheesehead shit was that? You ain't seen nothing yet, moose fucker! Keeping his eye on laundry, he sidestepped to the tap and commenced to top off his mug. It occurred to me suddenly that the police had indeed arrived, and the two of us were just standing there watching. All right, cut it out, you two. What's the meaning of this? Who started it? Oh, not you two fuckers again. You want some too, cock knocking moose fucker? His left ear was twitching like an innervated cat's tail. <laughs> I'll kill you, you son of a bitch! Laundry launched another charge. But Anderson was reeling in his breathing tube, and Laundry slipped on the nose piece and went down. Anderson started shaking and hyperventilating. Shoot him, Sheriff! Shoot him! Hey, play some Skinner, man! All right, you two, that's enough. Deputy, get Mr. Anderson's nose thing there. Dingle obliged. 
I picked up Laundry by the back of his belt and got him stood up. Cheesehead was pacing his end of the room like a tiger, only lifting his mug periodically to slug his beer. Fight's over, you two, and I'll have you know I could throw both of you in the cooler if I wanted. But I don't want to do that, so long as you both promise this is over. A bit of a bluff on my part. The cell was full of my old bowling trophies, and I was still looking for the key. I've had enough, sheriffs. <laughs> Knocked the damn wind out of me. But this ain't over. Laundry smoothed his shirt down and stumbled out the door. Good a promise as any, I suppose. A few of the younger patrons seemed to have noticed Dingle's clothespin and were commenting back and forth about it. Once Laundry was gone, the cheese guy took a breath and his ear stopped wiggling. Hey, sorry about all that, Sheriff. Things got a little out of hand there for a minute. Hey, no harm done. How about a beer? You guys want some beers? Dingle and I just stared at each other for a second. The patrons all went back to drinking their beers and enjoying their cheesy appetizers. And not for the first time that week, I didn't know what the hell to do. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it has to be this. Never allow yourself to get caught off guard. And I'll tell you, since Cheese Guy had come to town, that's the only way I'd been getting caught at all. The deputy and I declined and made our way back to the car. As we pulled away, I saw a laundry hobbling through his swinging bar doors, a look of despair on his face. Could it be the market just sorts this thing out? Enough people did seem to enjoy what Cheese Guy was doing, more than what Laundry was doing, anyway. Was I out of bounds trying to run this fella out of town? Maybe all this hoopla was just the death throes of an unsuccessful business. Maybe progress was inevitable. Who was I to stand in the way of it? Or maybe my police intuition served me right. The whole infernal fissure opening beneath split tail hypothesis. Who was I not to stand in the way of it? the high sheriff himself in all his prestige and glory. If I couldn't keep my grip on this big arm wall, then who the hell could? No, Laundry was right. This wasn't over. This wasn't over one bit. You can take the clothespin off there, deputy. Oh, right. Here you go, sheriff. I pinned my fishing license and photo of Summer back to my visor. And there she was, looking down on me as always. Looking down from the climbing towers and great spires of Schenectady. Here I was, trying to seal a veritable gate to hell, while Summer had been so eager to jump right into one. And leave me, of all people, a man in a position of power, righteous as all get out, and with a mustache that's the envy of all men, and dive right into the belly of the beast. She'd come back to me, I knew. It was only a matter of time. But for now, it was time to put past grievances aside. There was work to be done. Dingle, I'll tell you what. I understand some things happened in the past. Same with me. But the past is the past. And this is now. And we've got a job to do. And I don't want to seem too alarmist or anything. But you know how at the end of the second act of a three-act story, it seems like the stakes couldn't be any higher? Like the fate of the whole universe hangs in the balance, and the protagonist has to overcome his shortcomings and prepare for the big clash at the end? Well, that's now, Dingle. That's now. The deputy and I met eyes. I'm with you, Sheriff. And with that, there was only one thing left to do. Well, two things. First, tacos. Second, a massive expansion of government power. If you'll allow me to elapse time a bit, the next few days were a quiet maelstrom of good versus evil. Cheese Guy, for his part, seemed to change his mission statement every morning, and along with it, the sign out front of the bank building. Law for Marjorie became the Cheese and Beer Garden, became cheese, beer, and barbershop, became bar, grill, hair, nails, and hardware, and by now stood as its own emerging town simply named Metro Wisconsin. Added to the mix, along with a number of employees from God knows where, 
were a tarot reading and astrology service and a vegetarian noodle stand. Stranger still, some Asian lady who claimed to make your eyebrows straighter by rubbing string on your face and something called bubble tea, which the way I saw it was bound to choke someone to death. Laundry sulking in his empty pub across the way, I'd imagine was flirting with the idea of choking himself to death. He did have one customer left, of course, which I'm sure would be more helpful if he didn't have a 75% off sheriff's discount. Of course, that was a small price to pay to avoid retribution from said sheriff after this last somewhat vicious election cycle. I'm sure you understand. If you'd shot him last week like you were supposed to, Sheriff, no one would have noticed. Now the son of a bitch is Mr. Popularity. How are you supposed to off him now? Now what kind of sheriff would I be if I did such a thing like that, Laundry? Besides, I think it was Socrates that said the pen is mightier than the sword, wasn't it? Or was that Confucius? I wasn't suggesting you stab him, Sheriff. I'm suggesting you shoot him. Liberace bleated in agreement. I pulled out my fancy manila envelope and showed it to him. What Laundry didn't know was I'd spent the last few nights putting together some brand new executive orders. Stuff that'd really get cheese guy's ears shaking. Wait till I lay these on him, Laundry. I've got everything from maximum capacity, air quality, defibrillation stations, price controls, the works. When he gets a load of these, he'll be packing up and heading north before you know it. Laundry saw the thickness of my folder and gave me a nod. Not the kind of nod that inspires confidence, however. More like the kind of nod you'd give your kid when he tells you he's going to be a pro ball player. God, help us, Sheriff. Oh, I'm counting on that, Laundry. I'm counting on it. Heading across the way to the old bank building, I saw the situation was even worse than I'd thought. Cheese Guy's empire had spread to the nearby buildings on either side. To the left, a winery slash distillery was underway, and a sign was going up that read, The Pretentious Parsnip. To the right, some kind of Mexican place called the Entitled Taco, the subtitle of which read Best Tacos and Split Tail, soon to include dry cleaning services. And wouldn't you know it, another subtitle right under that that said, Low-carb tortillas available. Well, goddamn, I said. Ignatius was right. This was the cutthroatest capitalism I had ever seen. Not even an attempt to hide the crosshairs over our most vital institutions. A blatant bullseye on my own favorite lunch spot. A rich history soon to be replaced. Ousted by the very interlopers mulling about the square right now. Purple-haired and pocked with strange piercings. Squat and fat, or oddly skinny and spider-like. Clothing not unlike the makeshift tents of Wally's camp. And where the hell had they all come from? From straight out of the fissure itself? What the hell happened to Split Tail Dingle? Right under our noses. What the hell have we allowed to... But what I saw next stopped me dead in my tracks. As if this whole scene didn't get me flustered enough, my eyes landed on a full-figured gal in a sundress, standing near the burgeoning taco joint. Not that it's so unusual to see a full-figured gal near a taco joint, but there was something else about her. Something about the way she stood, with the gentle breeze rustling her hair in the bottom of her dress. It couldn't be, could it? I made my way over there, suddenly unconcerned with everything else. She was holding one of those bubble tea things, reading the menu taped to the window. Halfway there, I thought I could even smell her perfume. It could have been my imagination, I realized. All of this could. I only realized how fast I was walking when I heard Dingle's footfalls trying to keep up. Still. It felt like the longest journey I had ever made. I stopped maybe five feet behind the woman, wondered about the most polite way to get her attention. But she must have sensed me there herself, 
because it wasn't a second or two before she looked over her shoulder, then turned around to face me. Summer, you're back. Ron, I knew you'd show up. She threw her arms around me and we embraced. Everything I remembered about her, the smell of her hair, the feeling of her against me, it hit me like the all-encompassing heat of a warm bath. In that moment, it was just the two of us. Everything past, present, and future all at once. Right in that moment. But a moment was all it was. Not the extended, swirling embrace I had always pictured in my private moments. Not that at all. She patted me on the back. Three pats. Then she pulled away and held me at arm's length. Oh my gosh, how long has it been? It's so nice to see you. How you been? It was a second or two before I could even open my mouth. Didn't matter. She was already on to Dingle. Ernie! Oh my gosh, you haven't changed a bit. How long has it been? Like ten years? Oh my gosh. I can't believe you're here, I said. I don't suppose you're thinking of... Oh my gosh, it's so nice up there in the city. You'd love it so much, Ron. I've gotten like a week off, and you remember Amy. On Facebook, she was like, Oh my gosh, they're building all this stuff down there. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just gotta check it out. So I'm like, whatever, I've got some time. So it's like, wow, I can't believe it. I'm so happy Split Tail is finally coming around. It's like the Stone Age here, and like... Look at this. Oh my gosh. She held out her cup of bubble tea with the little balls in it. So you're... How long are you planning on staying, Summer? Oh my gosh, I've got an audition, like, tomorrow. I'm supposed to play this lady who's, like, babysitting or something, and then this dad comes home early or whatever. It's like a one-scene BBW thing, but... Ty! Oh, Ty, come here! I turned to look where she was waving and saw a big black fella ambling toward us. He seemed to cover twice the distance at half the speed of anyone else in the square. He put an arm around Summer's waist and pulled his sunglasses down an inch to regard us. Sup? And this is Tyron, my fiancé. Ty, meet Ron and Ernie. I've known them for like, oh my gosh, for like forever. Ty's a model. This final sentence she leaned in and delivered with a kind of confidentiality. You see they got them eyebrow strings? Shit. He mostly does magazines and stuff. Anyway, it's so nice to see you guys. Oh my gosh, I knew you'd probably show up. But anyway, stay in touch, Kay. See you guys. Booty snatcher on Instagram. Peace. And they left. Just like that. I watched her walk away for a while, not sure how long, until the hem of her dress disappeared behind the side of the bank building, followed by the back of her fiancé's size 16 sneaker. There was a lot for me to absorb just then, like whatever had just happened may not have really happened at all, like that sudden realization that it had all been a dream, and I had been dreaming I realized. No, I don't mean I just dreamed I'd been reunited with my old flame after all these years. I mean I'd been dreaming the whole damn time before that, and only now just woke up. God damn. I sighed and turned to Dingle, and if you thought I was bad off at that moment, you should have seen him. Shell-shocked again, that distant look in his eyes. Dingle? What the hell is it now, Dingle? It was him, Sheriff. That was the guy. What? The hell are you talking about, Deputy? The Black Inches guy. Summer's boyfriend, Sheriff. That was the guy in the magazine. What? Come on, Dingle, be serious. You sure? I'm sure of it, Sheriff. I seen his wiener. It's huge. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement... It has to be this. No matter how good you think you are, or how much you think you know, you can get the whole rug yanked out from under you in a second flat. 
It took me quite a while to learn that one. It only occurred to me in the last minute or so. What I hadn't learned yet was what I was supposed to do now. My first inclination was to head back to Laundry's, hand him my badge and gun, then go home and sleep for a few years. I could do that. Or I could open up Microsoft Notepad again and try my hand at mournful poetry. Maybe get one of those Apple computers and hang out in coffee shops for the rest of my life, writing the world's most depressing novel. What would Miss Summer think of me then? I revisited the thought. About the same she thought of me now. Nothing at all. I looked down at the manila envelope tucked under my arm. A tome of tyranny that would make the likes of Kim Jong-un blush. No, I decided. I could decide on all that depressing stuff later. Deep inside, I signed my own declaration reserving the right to completely self-destruct. And just maybe I'd go ahead and do that. But not now. I'd come this far, and now it was time to save the universe. I left Dingle in his state of derangement and stomped into the bank building. Mr. Cheesefellow was behind the bar working the tap so fast the whole operation looked like a guy pulling off the one-man band routine. The bar was packed, the tables were full, and wouldn't you know it, BTO was on the jukebox. Under normal circumstances, polite as I am, I might have waited for it to slow down a little bit. Maybe slide the envelope to him, make a clever quip or two, and take my leave. But due to recent circumstances, I wasn't feeling all that polite just then. I'm sure you'll understand. Hear ye, hear ye. Let it be known to all present and to posterity that we, the citizens of Split Tail, do hereby proclaim that this establishment sucks. Also, we proclaim with great solemnity that we have weighed and measured the products and services herein and find them wanton. Also, the proprietor of this substandard establishment worships the devil and has a funny accent. Let it be resolved that the highly inconvenient regulations contained herein be adopted forthwith. Also, BTO sucks. Signed and sealed, the High Sheriff of Split Tail. I tossed the manila envelope on the bar. Good luck with this one, cheese fella. But when I turned around to leave, I felt the same folder hit my back. I turned around. You think I don't know what you're up to, Moose Fucker? I played along with your cheese shit because I'm a pretty nice guy, eh? But if you want to regulate Metro Wisconsin, you better elect a commissioner first, okay? And I dare you to go ahead and do it, because I'll run right now, fucker. I don't give a fuck. Think I'll get any votes? He made a grand gesture around his burgeoning empire. Only the slightest twitch of his left ear. A commissioner. My bluff had been soundly called. Cheese fella must have known the truth before he even thought of setting up shop here. That this whole town's faith and credit was just keeping things the way they were yesterday. Government here was no more than a staff erected in the wilderness. And Cheese fella had just plucked it out of the ground right in front of me. Any other day, I might have been able to convince myself that this was just another battle in a greater war. But between this and Dingle and Summer, most of all Summer, the last bit of whatever was holding me upright just drained through the bottom of my feet. I turned to walk out, feeling more defeated than I have ever felt in my life. And I can't say if it was Socrates or Confucius or Metallica, or whichever one of our great thinkers came up with the line, fight fire with fire. But in retrospect, Whoever it was must have had my next comment in mind. Moose fucker, I mumbled. What'd you call me? I turned back around. Cheese Guy's eyes were white all around. His nostrils were flaring like a bull's. His ear was going a hundred miles an hour. What the fuck did you call me, Moose fucker? Uh, Moose fucker. Figured you'd like that one, don't you, Moose fucker? 
you could see the veins pulsing in Cheese Guy's forehead. A whole new level of crazy was coming over him. A look that said, this is the last thing you see before you die. No one, and I mean no one, calls me a moose fucker and lives, moose fucker. I'll fuck your ass to death. And I'll be damned if the guy didn't pick up the biggest cheese knife I've ever seen and vault right over the bar. You know, it only seemed fitting I was about to meet my maker. The whole week had been like death by a thousand cuts. Between watching my town go to hell and my inability to do anything about it, my best pal in the world reduced to a basket case, and my hopes and dreams dashed to pieces by so many black inches. I didn't feel like there was a whole lot to live for just then. And while all that played before my eyes in slow motion with the backdrop of Cheese Fella clearing to 15 or so feet between us, I wondered if the warm embrace of death would feel anything as nice as summers, for the two or so seconds I enjoyed it anyway, or if I'd get a similar pat on the back up at the pearly gates, or if I'd get turned away for failing my divinely appointed duty Whatever awaited me just then, I was ready to accept it. I didn't wonder too long, though. Cheesefella's legs went out from under him and the knife went flying, stuck in the dartboard across the room. Two bullseyes. Behind me, I saw one shoe on the floor. A little ways behind that, I saw Dingle on his ass, wearing the other shoe. A ways behind that, the bedazzled Smith & Wesson 500 Yolanda had bought him. He was coming right at you, Sheriff. Dingle, you're back. Yeah. Sorry about all that, Sheriff. Wieners, you know. Law and order. Talk about rat scattering. A shot from a 50 cal is quite the pest repellent. The bank building cleared out before you could say Bachman Turner Overdrive. Most, I suspected, were headed back to Cooter County or wherever the hell they came from. The McMillans had both seen Cheese Guy coming at me the way he did, so I wasn't worried about any legal trouble. Dingle was back at the station filling out the obligatory paperwork, and I was sitting in my cruiser just enjoying the peace and quiet of the empty town square. I glanced up at the visor as I'm often wont to do. Saw the old photo of Summer and me pinned up there. I unpinned it, inexplicably sniffed it, then folded it down the middle a few times and carefully ripped off the side with Summer and tossed it out the window. My side I pinned back on the visor and I kept my expired fishing license too, symbolically if for any reason because some things just need to be tossed aside, and although other things may be out of date, they're still worth holding on to. And if you're the type who needs a moral message in your stories, I suppose that's probably the best I can do for you, at least this time around. And adapting to the times? Well, maybe just a little. Only when it helps you leave those less savory bits of the past behind. So saying, I took a picture of myself making duck lips and used that funny program Dingle likes to put bunny ears on me and texted it to him, just to let him know everything was A-OK. -okay. A minute later, he sent me back a picture of him with sunglasses and a big mustache just like mine. And I must say, the look suited him. The magnificent bastard saved my life today. It was only right I made one more stop before quitting time. It was one of those rare perfect weather days in Split Tail. Nice enough to remind you that maybe all was well in the world after all. Or at least the fissure underneath the town had stopped pulsating for the time being. And with all that newfound quiet, for the very first time all week I knew exactly what to do next. You see, being high sheriff of this town as long as I have, you get a sixth sense about certain people's peculiarities. So it wasn't long before I parked politely in front of the duplex in Old Mill Street. I walked up the riggedy old porch and pushed aside all the old boxes of newspapers and comic books in my way. I knocked a few times and before long, the disheveled inhabitant came to the door. The smell coming from inside was just like I thought it'd be. Um, 
Can I help you, officer? Afternoon, Mr. Black Wiener fella. I'm investigating the disappearance of a certain bicycle. A Schwinn, I believe it was. And I do believe you know exactly where I can find it. And that was The Cheese Head by Jeff Sturdivant. A good reminder that to move forward, you gotta let go of the past. Speaking of which, Hams is the new king of beers. A little about the author. My good friend Jeff Sturdivant is a deliverer of parcels and teller of stories. He likes to call me when I'm busy and keep me on the phone until I'm exhausted and need a nap. If you happen to see someone dancing inappropriately to a Yacht Rock tune at a grocery store, it might be him. For audiobooks he's written, check out FlexFiction.com. And for audiobooks he's narrated, check out FlexFiction.net. And a little about our pal Paul. Our moose fucker friend Paul is the narrator of 166 books on Audible to date. Host from Fear from the Heartland with five full seasons available wherever you listen to your podcasts and current host of the Wednesday night edition of the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. If you're ever in a fancy restaurant and keep hearing a cricket that no one can seem to locate, it might be Paul fucking with you. For Paul's catalog of audiobooks, visit paulsbooks.net and start shopping. Cheese is more expensive than ever these days, y'all but a credit is still a credit. Thanks, Paul. And thank you, Jeff. It was about damn time. Hey, y'all, let's all join together in the great anticipation of the next episode in the Split Tail series. Should be ready in the year 2047 or thereabouts. <clears throat> and do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a hams for the road, friend. The land of blue sky waters is that away. I want to go ahead and say hello and give a big thank you and welcome to the newest members of my Patreon. So a big shout out to Lisa Knight, Dana Kulhoff, Elizabeth Balick, and Old Crumbs. Y'all support of me means a lot to me and Old Chester. It really does. Thank y'all so very much. Patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood. And may the wind be at your backs. And may the road rise up to meet you. And until next time, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Pretty creative, huh? Good night, y'all. Chilling t-
tales for dark nights.